So maybe we could repeat the conversation we were having um, at the restaurant over lunch and just start with a sketch on yourself and how you came here and your role at uh, Rutgers and we'll move from there. Well, I actually got interested in uh, literacy by an interest, a long-term interest in uh, language in the brain. And my first experiences with that was really working with adult patients who had lost their language from as a result of brain damage. I was just absolutely amazed and horrified that you could lose the ability to communicate either um, through expressive language, expressing yourself, or uh, even understanding what other people said. So I've been interested from the point early in my uh, education, from that early experience I had being able to work as a volunteer in an aphasia unit. But when I went to graduate school, I became interested in uh, children who were having difficulty just developing the ability to talk, even though they seemed to be developing uh, quite normally and healthily in, in all other ways. And at the time, there was not that much known about these children, and they were basically, uh, it was known that there are lots of ways you could end up with difficulty learning to talk. Of course, uh, if you had a hearing problem or were deaf, it would be very difficult to learn oral language. If you had severe mental retardation, you might not have the capacity for language. Uh, if you had difficulty in moving your mouth or had an oral motor difficulty, that could, or cleft palate or something like that, could have impact your language development. But there still remained a very large group of children, and uh, recent epidemiological research actually suggests it's as high as uh, almost 8% of children who, even after you exclude all these other known reasons why kids might have difficulty learning to talk, there is this group of children with unknown origin who nonetheless struggle um, to learn oral language. And um, longitudinal research, of which I've done and other people have done, following children with early oral language um, developmental delays, find that there's a high coincidence of these children ultimately developing difficulty in reading, writing, and particularly spelling. So um, I became interested in the whole continuum between oral and written language, and particularly what we could learn by studying children who were struggling. And uh, my particular interest was how the brain does it. Um, there are a lot of different aspects of research that have to do with uh, looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at children. I'll start over that. There are a lot of different aspects that have to do with looking at children um, who are struggling to learn to talk or learn to read and try to figure out what's the problem, especially so we could learn um, to develop more effective remediations intervention programs. But the area that has always interested me most is uh, if we could understand how the brain develops the representations of the sounds of speech and puts those sounds together to make words and words together to make sentences and ultimately the interactions that we have uh, when we communicate with each other, we could understand how the brain actually does this, that we might really be able to get the real clue as to what to do uh, to help children whose brains are not doing that so well for them. So my interest has always been in understanding uh, um, the neurobiological underpinnings of uh, language development and disorders. And uh, by language, I mean language in the broader sense, both uh, oral and written language, because after all, written language must stand on the shoulders of oral language. It's, uh, it's not that you can't learn to read if you don't have an oral language, um, but it's very difficult, we know. Even deaf individuals who have a completely, um, um, a completely uh, full-blown uh, sign language system if they don't have a phonological base to that sign system, the ability to hear what the individual sounds are like inside of words, it's very difficult to learn to read. And that's also another clue as to what reading is all about. Now, when we look at a child learning to read, we certainly see the visual side of it. Most people, when they think about reading, think about the visual side of reading because it's so obvious. There's these, these squiggles on the page, and that's what you're going to have to learn to put together. That's the code, or at least that's what people have thought for years was the code. But it turns out that that code has to be decoded, as it were, in terms of the sounds that um, are made inside of words, because those letters actually have to come to represent not the words, but the sounds inside of words. And that is the real um, key to learning to read, becoming what is known in the field as phonologically aware. And phonological awareness means a knowledge that words, the awareness that words 
can actually be broken down into smaller parts, and those parts are called the phoneme, or the speech sound. And the phoneme builds together words, both for oral language and for written language. And it turns out that children who have difficulty with uh, written language, as a group, not all of them, but as a, as a whole, the, the large majority of them have difficulty in becoming phonologically aware uh, in playing little word games, um, being able to uh, know that the word um, um, plate without the p is late. Okay, now people who have coded the whole word, who can say the word plate perfectly well, unless they're phonologically aware that they can get inside the word, they have very great difficulty in knowing that plate without the p would make the word late. Uh, or plate without the t would make the word play. So these were clues that this has nothing to do with the visual aspects of language. It has something to do with the acoustics of language, what the sounds actually sound like inside of words. Now, those two things come together. The fact that children who have trouble with reading, on the whole, have difficulty with the smaller sounds inside of words, the phonemes. And also the fact that children who have significant difficulty learning to talk also have difficulty with the sounds inside of words. But they, their difficulty shows up much earlier in life. And also the fact that children who have trouble with oral language generally will go on to have difficulty with written language, even if it's more subtle difficulty later on with spelling. So those all come together to form what I consider to be an oral to written language continuum. And I've been interested in what the brain has to tell us about how the brain learns to begin with, how the brain particularly learns phonology, the phonological system, and um, how that ultimately translates into uh, um, the development of a language all the way up to the level of grammar or interaction or, uh, between people and also into reading. So, I'm going to stop for a second. <coughs> okay, so then how does... Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right, so then how does the brain ultimately go from the little baby lying in the crib and everyone's saying, oh, what a pretty little baby you are. Look at those big blue eyes. How do you get from all that sound that the baby's being bathed in, really, to the point that the baby can pull out these individual sounds and knows that those are indeed the sounds that they're going to have to use to build up their own language and their own reading system? Well, one way, one hypothesis is that you're just born with that that it's innate, that it's pre-specified that you know it. But that can't possibly be the case because you don't know which language you're going to be born into. You don't know um, what people are going to say to you. And um, so it can't be just that this is innate. That doesn't mean that there might not also be um, structures in the brain that have developed over time that make it more likely that you as a human being are going to be able to pull this uh, code apart than uh, a non-human. Of course there are. But that doesn't really answer the question as to what really has to happen. So clearly the baby's lying in its crib. It doesn't know which language it's going to be um, exposed to. It may have even already heard some sounds in utero. We have some evidence from research that that's the case. But nonetheless, the baby's job is to, the baby's brain's job, is to basically chop apart the sounds that it's hearing and to figure out which ones are going to be meaningful as the building blocks or the phonemes for their language. And then that brings us into how does the brain learn in general. And the brain seems to learn in general by looking for consistencies, looking for uh, events that repeat themselves quite frequently. And those events are usually made up of visual input, auditory input, um, feeling in the mouth for the baby, um, feeling on the body, the sensory events of the world. And the baby's job, or the baby's brain's job, is to begin to understand and to code neurally in the brain, to map its own brain through experience as to what's going to matter and what's not going to matter. Now, to begin with, it's very well known that, in fact, babies can discriminate the sounds of all the languages in the world. And that would make sense, because they don't know which ones are going to be important. Okay, so babies 
have to be, um, as my colleague Pat Cool says, citizens of the world when they're first born. But very quickly, within the first six months of life, babies come to only be able to hear the differences between those sounds that are important in their language, their set of phonemes, and begin to not even be able to discriminate the sounds of other languages that are not used in their own. So in trying to understand how that occurs in the brain is a big clue to how the brain is actually breaking up the system and beginning to what we call represent the individual sounds as neural firing patterns. Now what we know from other kinds of research, particularly animal research, is something called Hebbian learning, neurons that fire together in time will wire themselves up. And the more often a set of neurons fire together, the more likely it is that they'll fire again together and form an easier and easier representation. So it'll be easier and easier to get that set of neurons to fire off together and wire up together. And it's believed at this point that the firing together of information in time will bind that information together and say, okay, this is a chunk of information which is occurring on a regular basis statistically in your environment. It must be important. Pull that together and make it easy for your brain to respond to it. And we think that that has something to do with the basic units in which the brain is going to perceive the phonological building blocks of language. So what does the brain have to do to even get to that point? What does it mean fire together? Well, we know that our nervous system is organized in, in very detailed maps, which you have to learn, which relate to the features of the environment. So for example, in the visual modality, we have neurons that just, fall, that just fire to certain um, hues of color, and other ones that fire to different line orientations, and other ones that will um, you know, fire to rapid changes in the environment. And the same is true in the auditory modality. And in the auditory modality, we really, um, for the acoustics that we are hearing in speech, we really know that they can be broken down into three main categories. There's the frequency of the sound, how high or how low it is. There's the intensity of sound, how loud or how soft it is. And there's the duration of sound, how long or how short it is. And there, of course, are also frequency changes because one of the most fundamental characteristics of speech is that it's created by moving mouths or moving speech articulators. And that creates very rapid frequency changes that are occurring really quickly in time. And we know that we have specific neurons that pick up particular slopes of frequency change going from low to high or from high to low. <clears throat> so we know we have all of those. And so as the brain begins to hear sound, not just speech, but all the other sounds in the environment, it will begin to map itself in a very organized fashion. So that the lowest frequencies are right next to the next lower ones and next to the next. So in the end, we have what's called tonotopic representation in the, in the brain. That occurs both in the ear and also higher up in the brain. So if we have a speech sound, it's actually pretty complicated. An individual speech sound, a syllable like ba, we just move our mouth, we put it in a certain place like a flute, and then we go to whatever vowel we want. We can go ba, we can go boo, you know, bo. They're all the same in that it begins with closure at the lips, ba. Okay? But the vowel is very different. The vowel can be a high vowel or a low, made up of high frequencies or low frequencies. And so the trajectory of where we closed our lips to get to the vowel creates what's called a formant transition. And basically that is just a frequency sweep. And it's a series of frequency sweeps that then uh, come to represent those particular speech sounds. So the brain's job is to pull together those features, the neurons that fire together, including the frequency, the intensity, the time, these frequency sweeps, when they all fire together, they'll wire up together. And when they occur, a lot of times, what a pretty baby you are, what big blue eyes, the B is happening a lot. And so the theory is, at least, that those are going to wire up together. So that's all fine for most of us. That works out great. And you say, what big blue eyes? Daddy has those blue eyes. Well, the D is not the same as the B, obviously. Um, 
you are a you are a um, this is your dad, you know. Um, you are bad. Those are very similar words. Um, they mean completely different things, but they really only differentiate bad and dad are completely the same, except at the very onset, whether you put your mouth together, your lips together at the front or at the hard palate. Bad, dad, and acoustically, they're almost identical. The whole word is identical, except for about the first 30 or 40 milliseconds. Okay? And there's lots and lots of words and lots and lots of speech sounds that are different only in terms of one or two acoustic features. And so obviously those acoustic features are really important. <clears throat> now the other thing that's really special about speech is that it just keeps on coming at us. Okay, it's fast. Um, people talk, even if you talk slowly, you're still moving these complicated muscles in your entire speech articulatory system very quickly. And it's a highly precise movement that will differentiate what the acoustics are that are coming out. So that when I say, what a pretty boy you are, um, you know, you've got all these sounds coming out together. What a pretty girl you are. You know? So um, those are, you have to follow that. The brain has to follow all those sounds and chunk them out, all the individual pieces, and then put them all back together again. So that's the process that needs to be taken care of. So how does this have anything to do with, with uh, children who have trouble learning to talk or learning to read? When I first started doing my research in the early 70s, I was interested in trying to understand what the problems at the linguistic level were for these children. What are the problems that they were having learning the grammar of a language, learning uh, how it all worked together, how to express their thoughts and their feelings and whatever. But I was trained as an experimental psychologist, and I knew that the first thing you had to do was to rule out more basic problems. So the obvious things that I would have to rule out is that the children could hear, that they didn't have a hearing problem, that they weren't mentally retarded, that they didn't have any problem with the oral musc musculature. All the basic building blocks of language I had to demonstrate first were going to be in place before I could begin to understand what was specifically linguistically the problem for these children. It also occurred to me that there was more to processing the complex acoustic structure of language, ongoing language, than just hearing at the peripheral level. That one, I was very interested in what happened to the sound when it left the ear and moved through the nervous system into the brain. And what are all the different pieces that must be in place to ultimately get to the point that you would be able to organize these acoustic features, put them in into words, words into sentences, whatever. So I developed a series of uh, processing tasks for little children who were about six to nine years old, just to make sure that they could hear fully. Uh, they could hear not only detect that sounds occurred, but also could organize sounds that were occurring that were more complex, that were occurring in rapid, that were brief and occurring rapidly in succession made up of combinations of frequencies and amplitudes and all the things that would be necessary to ultimately process and represent a speech sound. And pretty much to my surprise, because I really thought these were just control tests to rule out that there was any problem here so we could get to the language part of the problem, very much to my surprise it turned out that on the whole children who were struggling to learn to talk who did not have a hearing impairment, who were not mentally retarded, didn't seem to have anything else wrong with them. Their normal, healthy, happy children seemed to be developing great. They were quite different in the way in which they organized basic non-linguistic signals, complex auditory signals in general. The building blocks in which one would assume you had to put together to come to extract the phonemes of a language really weren't in place for these children. And in particular, they seem to be having difficulty tracking and integrating brief, rapidly successive um, tones of different frequencies. So they were having difficulty tracking frequency changes that were occurring rapidly in succession. And that's rather critical for language since speech is a series of rapidly successive acoustic changes that have to be tracked and coded and represented. So um, did a lot more studies with children with uh, language problems and found that it seems to be a hallmark of many, not all, but many children who are struggling with both oral and written language, 
that they are slow processors, that their brain just needs more time between events to integrate them and track them over time. And um, this became known as the temporal processing um, deficit. Um, temporal was only a part of the problem. It's really a temporal spectral processing problem. That means a difficulty tracking acoustic frequency changes occurring over time. And um, that problem, interestingly, turns out to be something you can pick up quite early in life in uh, children. Uh, we've just recently completed a study in which we looked at um, normally developing infants who were four to six months of age to begin with, um, just you know, brought a bunch of little healthy babies into the lab, and we wanted to know whether or not we could determine how much time they needed between little tones of different frequencies just to indicate whether they heard the same two signals or two different signals. So they would come in to the lab and we would train them to look to a little toy that was on their right side if they heard beep beep, a low signal followed by a high signal, but to turn their head and look to a toy on that side of the room if they heard beep beep, the same two sounds. So look over here if you hear two different ones and over here if you hear two same. Now of course they don't know the concept of same or different. These are just normally developing six month old infants, but they can be fairly easily trained to look to this side for beep beep and over here for beep beep. Okay. And they do that because when they look in the right direction, this little toy claps its hands and they're very excited because they've c controlled the world and that's what they're here to do. You know, learn how to do things. It's all about learning. So when they've learned to do that, they get very happy and they'll look in the right direction and you can actually determine uh, very, very well what that individual baby's threshold is for how fast can these sounds now come together for them to continue to perform at a high level of accuracy. So you start off with nice long signals with short, with nice long intervals. Beep, beep, something like that. And then as the baby continues to correctly respond, you very subtly begin to just decrease that time, that silent gap between the end of the first signal and the beginning of the sig second signal. So it might eventually come, become beep, beep, and then later even beep, beep, okay? And what we want to know is how fast do those two come before you've lost it? And there's a point for every one of us when the signals come so fast that you can no longer hear the difference between them, and that's called your, your sensory threshold. So we wanted to know what that threshold was for each of our little babies. And then we had another group of babies, and these were babies that were born into families that already had one or more family members who had a either a current or a history of oral or written language problems. We've done it both ways. So we wanted to know if you have a family history of a language learning problem, is your ability to track these brief sensory events, the acoustic events, different than a baby who did not? Well, we followed a lot of babies over time. And then what we do is once we've established their thresholds when they're about six months old, we can then track these babies and really uh, evaluate these individual children's language development trajectory. So we can see them again when they're 12 months old and when they're 18 and when they're 24 months old and 36 months old, and you can just carry on following them up. And um, this work was done by my colleague primarily, uh, April Benesich at Rutgers University. And what we found was that if we just know the individual sensory integration threshold, auditory integration threshold for an individual infant, regardless of whether or not they do or don't have a family history of a language learning problem, that's the best predictor of language development. And we've only gone up to about three years old now, but all the way up to three years old. So knowing something as simple as how much time you need to organize the information that you hear is highly predictive of your language development. Now those children who had very, uh, who were able to have very low thresholds, that means they could process very quickly this sensory information, beep beep, something really fast, 
um, those children turn out to develop language more quickly than the children who seemed otherwise to do the task perfectly normally. They could learn it just fine, but they needed just a little bit more time. Beep, beep, something like that. And then there were other kids who needed a lot more time, like hundreds of milliseconds. They needed something like beep, beep, okay? They still were doing the task beautifully, but they just couldn't hear those differences when they went any more quickly than that. Those children turned out to be, frankly, language impaired. But it turned out there was a whole continuum from those children who learned language very quickly to those children who uh, appeared, at least at the age of three months old, to be at risk for real language problems. And of course, now we're going to continue following these babies up and see whether or not that also predicts whether or not they're going to have difficulty learning to read. So um, these early acoustic processing abilities set our brain up for how we're going to organize the incoming world. We, our brains really are experience-dependent learning machines, if you want to call it that. Um, we need our environment to stimulate the um, anatomical and physiological properties of the brains that we were born with. Without the environmental input, um, there's very little that's going to happen for us uh, as humans uh, and even for, as animals. So it's an interaction between, clearly a very significant interaction between nature and nurture. We need our own physical environment to stimulate our brains. And for language users, in order to break the code for, for language, which ultimately is a phonemic code, um, for at least for the English language, it's very much a phonemic code for our written language as well. We need to be able to organize the sounds that we hear very quickly in time because the acoustic changes that tell us which speech sound we've just heard are, are frequency and amplitude changes that occur quickly in time. So um, where does that leave us? It leaves us with knowing a lot about... Uh, the underpinnings of how the brain begins to process the sensory world, turn that into the phonological uh, representations and turn those into syllables, words, phrases, um, and ultimately allow us to develop a written code, which is the uh, orthographic or letters that go with those sounds. And that we know that when you have trouble anywhere along that route, you're going to have difficulty with either oral language and or written language. Now, a lot of people out there may be saying right now, well, you know, I have a child who's struggled a lot learning how to read, but they learn to talk perfectly well. They don't always go together, and that's true. There are many, many children who have difficulty learning to read who didn't have an overt oral language problem. And what I mean by that as overt is that there are lots of other routes to the same end. You can learn to talk relatively well without becoming that phonologically aware, without really needing to break the sounds down in your mind. It's only when you hit reading that you must become aware that words are made up of smaller units. But it doesn't mean that there really weren't subtle language problems. And in fact, one of the most remarkable scientific studies that has been published, in my opinion, recently, uh, was an epidemiological study funded by the National Institutes of Health that showed that if you just screened children who were entering public school, you know, five-year-olds who were entering public school way before you'd worry about their reading or anything like that, if you just screened their oral language abilities, that uh, almost 8% of them were so delayed in oral language development that they would frankly have been given a clinical diagnosis of having a language impairment if anyone had ever tested them. But in fact, very few of these children are tested because we allow a lot of individual differences in language development. In fact, when a child mispronounces words, it's very common up to a certain age, and everyone thinks it's kind of cute. You know, the child that says biscotti, you know, when they meant spaghetti, you know, or wabbit when they mean rabbit. Those are all normal, healthy developmental trends up to a certain point in time. But we allow a lot of individual differences, and we don't really know in, on the whole very well when is it too late to be still saying this getty or wabbit, you know? And when is it uh, uh, too late to be saying, um, you know, to not have your nouns and verbs um, go together and things like that properly? So um, we don't know very much as uh, um, a society about what the language milestones really are. So what was interesting about this study was that 
although almost 8% of the children um, would have met the clinical diagnosis of specific language impairment, um, I think the, the, it was 79% of those children had never been identified by anyone, their parents, their teachers, their pediatricians, anyone, as being at risk for a, a language or a reading problem. They had the problem, but um, you know, if you pointed out to a parent or something that the child really is delayed at language, you would get responses like, oh, I just thought he was shy, you know? Or, uh, well, no, he just really doesn't pay attention very well, or things along those lines. So uh, I've always thought of oral language problems as being the hidden problem, the unrecognized problem, especially for the receptive language part, which is really hard to know. Um, what is receptive language? It's um, the ability to understand what other people are saying. I mean, I'm talking right now and I'm having to assume, because people are shaking their heads and nodding, that they're understanding me. But in fact, I really don't know precisely what you do or don't understand. So it's a silent problem when a child's having a receptive language or a difficulty understanding, or one of these perceptual difficulties. <clears throat> if a child's having difficulty really hearing the subtle differences between you know, bad and dad. Well, over time they learn the context, you know. Um, you know, there are some confusing sentences like, uh, um, you know, that that was bad, that was dad. You know, it could have been either way. But most of the time our context really constrains what we're hearing. So you can get away with an awful lot without anyone noticing until you come to either try to read or spell. At which point the game is up. You either got it exactly, or you didn't. Um, of course, you can read in context, and you can guess words as well. But if you're really being asked to decode for real, then you must make that one-on-one -on -one correspondence. You must break the word apart and then put letters. So one of the most telling uh, tests that are being that's used now for determining a child's readiness to learn to read or whether or not a child is actually having a reading problem uh, is the ability to pronounce non-words Okay, what's a non-word? It's a series of, of uh, sounds that could have been a word, but just doesn't happen to be. So uh, um, let me think of a non-word. Um, you take any word and just change a couple of letters. So let's take the word like uh, rabbit. And I can just change the vowel from an A to an I, and it would have been ribbit. Could have been a word, just isn't a word. Okay, I could have changed the Bs to a to double T, so it could have been writ it. Could have been a word, isn't a word. Take a series of non-words and just ask a child to pronounce them. You know, so you give them a series of words starting with real simple ones and then ending up with multi-syllable ones. And that's one of the best tests of uh, determining whether a child is going to have a reading problem or is having a reading problem, just the pronunciation of non-words. A better test still is ask them to read a series of non-words. Now, what's the value of that? If you give children a list of real words to read, many, many children who nonetheless have a significant reading problem can pass that test very well, just like they can look like they didn't have an oral language problem. They can pronounce the individual words. They can memorize the word patterns from the visual display. Um, but they haven't really cracked the code. They haven't really learned that each of the letters has a sound that goes with it, and that those sounds can change in different contexts. So that is uh, one of the better signs of uh, a reading problem, either pronunciation of non-words or um, the reading of non-words. And it also helps us to, again, once more understand that it is a continuum between the development of sound systems in the brain into the development of phonological representations into the development of oral language and all the way through written language and spelling. So that's okay. Now, I didn't say anything about treatment, but we could get into that too. One of the most interesting parts in all this is that it sounds to me like you're describing um, the infrastructure of processing that's happening underneath all of this, mm -hmm. and that in different modalities, um, it's more timing critical. Mm -hmm. So in the case of um, um, reading as an example, as a, our main theme here, mm -hmm. in the case of reading, in, there has to be an assembly going on inside, mm -hmm. and the timing it's taking to, to put this assembly together 
is critical to whether the whole thing flows. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's quite different than listening to somebody, even though underneath it, the same processes are involved. Right. Well, I mean, a lot of people who've had, you know, who might have difficulty with this uh, hypothesis or theory would say, well, how does this really work for reading? Because after all, the word is on the page as long as you want to look at it. It's static. Yeah. And they don't really get that what we're talking about is what the brain has to go through. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Now, of course, in the auditory input, that is fleeting. We really have trouble if you have a timing difficulty in the brain. If your brain is processing information more slowly, um, then you're really going to have trouble with ongoing language because it just doesn't wait for you. But once but, you made the discrimination, yeah. there isn't any ambiguity. Right. Whereas right. with the code, there's lots of ambiguity to overcome. Yes. And assemble yes. while and, and still simulate the real time flow of right exactly. I mean, the, even if the word is on the page all day long, mm -hmm. um, the neural processes that your brain has to go through are still the same. You have to extract out the ultimately the the sounds from inside the words and learn to put letters to them. And th if you have represented those sounds in a fuzzy way, if your brain doesn't really clearly hear these very rapid acoustic onsets um, that differentiate um, various speech sounds from each other, then you have represented a, f a much broader um, pattern of neurons firing together. I mean, what we really need is nice, nice, neat, concise, and effective and efficient wham, you know, that's that sound, it's going to fire, and it's going to fire the same pattern every time, or a very similar pattern every time. And so then it becomes something that your brain doesn't have to wait to happen. You know? Now, if you have a broader representation, sometimes it sounds like ba, but sometimes it sounds like da, but sometimes it sounds like ga, which are almost all exactly the same acoustically, except for just a tens of milliseconds difference at the onset. Then deciphering out what you've really heard from the context is going to take a lot longer. And therefore, when you come to learn to read, even getting that there are individual sounds inside of words consistently is going to be very difficult. And if your brain has kind of lumped them together, or at least has fuzzy edges between these different boundaries, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Teachers saying, this is the ba, this is the letter B, it goes with the ba sound. And your brain sometimes is firing off and hearing ba, but sometimes it's firing off and hearing da. Not surprising, you really end up confusing that ba and da and ga sound. They are visually confusable, but they're also the most acoustically confusable sounds that we have. So there certainly is that whole process going on inside the brain that's not intuitive. And the problem is that it's also not intuitive for many, many teachers. I mean, we learn to talk, and we even learn to read many times without becoming very aware of how we're doing it. Very few of us have any idea how our brain is actually processing the speech sounds. It happens so early in our life, they're just so obvious to us that it's almost like you cannot fail to process them. Um, and the same thing is true of reading. So when you try to reverse engineer the whole thing in terms of, okay, now what's the most effective and efficient way to teach it? You know, that's where we really get into these reading wars. Because different people have completely different ideas of which, which ways are going to be the most effective and efficient way to teach it. Some people say, well, give them a, a rich you know, um, environment around which to learn to read. Give the child a lot of very compelling books and stories with a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of language environment, and the child will intuit how to pull out the reading code because it will be so interesting. That's the whole language approach, you know, to give the child a rich language environment full of good literature. Okay. And then there's the opposite point of view. It's, no, 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 you've got to teach children very mechanically the letter-sound correspondence. You've got to mechanically teach the child the phonics of the language in order for a child to become a proficient reader. So for the child who can't hear those acoustic signals very well, has very poor phonological um, representations or fuzzy phonological representations, they probably are going to need that very, very explicit training, but it's also going to be very difficult for them without the context. So, of course, they really need both. And the child who, you know, really has great phonological categories all represented in their brain and also has a good language, oral language basis and understand good communicative skills, you know, they come to reading, it really probably isn't going to make any difference at all which way you want to teach those children. They're going to learn to read 
um, because they've got such a great neurological and environmental base on which to build the written system. So for those children, which is the vast majority of them, it doesn't matter very much which method. They can be immersed in the reading method, both with phonics and in you know the whole language, and they'll do great. It's the kids who are struggling that really one needs to understand more individually what is going on for that child, and then to try to individually adapt the training that's best for them based on both their strengths and their weaknesses. Now, some people then go and say, well, you really, you really have to teach to a child's strengths. And other people say, no, 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 you have to teach to their weaknesses. And of course, you have to come up with ways of doing both. You know, we, what we really need to do is understand what's underlying the problems that these children may be having, individual children may be having. And through, in my, my belief, through the use of technology, which can be much more individually adaptive to the child's learning style, learning pace, underlying learning strengths and weaknesses, can build an individualized program for them um, to help them learn uh, through all the multiple routes that they might need to, um, to become a more effective reader. But I really do believe that all children can learn to read, but they may need, uh, most children need their own pace and their own particular route through the brain that they've developed through their own environment to get there. And of course, if English is not their primary language, but that is the language they're going to be asked to learn to read in, that creates a whole other layer in which we're going to want to strengthen the oral language skills, both at the phonological level as well as at the grammatical level and the comprehension level in order to give a good, solid base on which to learn to read. And that's a whole other issue. Yeah, it sure is. (laughs) Without the um, oral language proficiency in the native language, particularly in English, to be able to recreate that from the written system, Mm -hmm. in particular teaching people to read English that Mm -hmm. is not their native language, Mm -hmm. it's a real problem. Yeah, but you know, we have public schools that um, primarily are not in the business to teach people how to talk, they're in the business to teach children how to read. So what I think, to a great extent, one of the changes in our society is that there are many more children who are coming to school who really do need um, a direct approach to improving their oral language abilities and their communication abilities um, in order for them to become proficient readers. And we just don't have that in most cases. We go right into reading, and in fact, because so many children with oral language weaknesses, I'll call them, um, be they because the language they're learning at school is not their native language, or because they're one of these many children Mm -hmm. who, for unknown reasons or for many different reasons, are just weak at oral language skills. Their brain was set up in such a way that it is uh, not as effective in the oral language domain. Um, Those children are going to need more explicit help. Um, They're generally not picked up. They get to school. The first time anyone notices there's a problem is generally when they start to struggle with reading. And therefore, everyone just immediately assumes the problem's reading, and they go right into reading remediation. Very few children are ever seen for a formal oral language evaluation, which, in my opinion, is a real problem. You know, I think if a child is struggling with reading, that in addition to their reading evaluation, they need an oral language evaluation so that we know where along this whole continuum the child is, and that's where one needs to intercede to begin with, to move along. So the building blocks are that there's a distinction, an ability to recognize differences in sound in time mm-hmm. that's, that's important to be able to, in the technology world, they call it mm-hmm. the analog to digital converter, right, where we're slicing the analog stream mm-hmm. into chunks. Mm-hmm. So if they're not doing that fast enough, mm-hmm. then they don't have the granularity of distinction necessary. Mm-hmm. Then on the other side of that, once they have that, there's a frequency or speed of processing that's necessary to assemble mm-hmm. inside the, the, the mind to create mm-hmm. the virtually heard stream mm-hmm. in the reading process. And that any one of these things can cause a bog in processing. Right. It causes the stutter that breaks down reading. Right, right. I think, I uh, hope we can put your words in there. <laughs> that sounded perfect. <laughs> that was very good. Okay. Right. Um, you certainly got it. You got the. You uh, certainly have the. Uh... You know, as you know, part of what we're doing. I mean, you talked before. We talked a moment ago about the difference between whole language and, and phonics. And uh, 
as you know, uh, the, the reading wars have kind of shifted to the phonical side of the plate, mm -hmm. so to speak, particularly in light of California's massive crash, uh, having been uh, mm -hmm. on the edge of the whole language championing for a decade mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. saw a bunch of fourth graders crash and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so there is this move towards an integrated approach. And yet, <clears throat> it seems that uh, apart from the distinction and mm -hmm. processing frequency issues that we're talking about relative to oral language processing, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> when we talk about reading, we're talking about something else, mm -hmm. which is how all that works in relation to this code. That's right. This code is this man-made technology. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of our thinking, it appears, in terms of the whole language and phonics systems, Mm -hmm. are kind of compensations for the mess that's in that code. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things I'd like to draw out in our conversation now mm -hmm. is the difference as you would perceive it as a neuroscientist who's watching mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. watching the timing and so forth, mm -hmm. between the challenge to the brain of reading a phonetic code mm -hmm. and reading a code that's not phonetic mm -hmm. or that has a, a, the degree of phonetic ambiguity that the English language does. Mm -hmm. Right. So it seems to me that back to the timing precarious mm -hmm. piece, mm -hmm. that a phonetic code is much more straightforward mm -hmm. from a processing point of view mm -hmm. than a non-phonetic code mm -hmm. in terms of the timing precarious challenges to the brain to work them out right. in sufficient time to sustain the stream mm -hmm. flow. Right. So what I want to do is draw out from you how, that, how you could speak mm -hmm. to that. Okay. Um, not sure I'm going to get it. Exactly right. Um, Doesn't matter. We'll at. play with um, it till we do. Okay. What's interesting is that um, different languages mm -hmm. have more or less um, transparent orthographies. Okay. Orthography, of course, is the letter system. Now, it's interesting in some languages, there's really a one to one relationship between the letter and the sound it makes. Spanish is one of those letter, one of those languages. There's a there's a letter, there's a sound. And once you've learned those letters and those sounds, you can read just about any words that you want in Spanish, probably any words you want in Spanish correctly, even if you don't understand any of them. You can at least pronounce them correctly. And English is on the other end of the spectrum it seems with lots and lots of exceptions. I mean, who came up with e n o u g h spells enough? It should be E-N-U-F, okay? Um, that would be fine. But um, so English has many, many exceptions. And that, of course, adds additional complexities. So what I've described in terms of this roadblock, as it were, in the use of the acoustic information, which is coming into the brain very quickly in time and having to have that separated out and come up with nice, neat phoneme categories so that you can have those neurons that are firing together, wiring together, and getting really solidly wired. And you know, that's going to work really well uh, if you've got that all wired up for a system like Spanish. And it's going to work well for English, but it's not going to work perfectly for English because there's a whole lot of additional stuff that you have to uh, pull in. So English is going to be a much more difficult language and therefore we're going to probably have a lot more children struggling to learn it um, because there are additional brain processes. I mean, what happens is that there's always an interaction in the brain. There are very few, I mean, even though what we've learned in neuroscience and we, we tend to think about in terms of this piece of the brain does X and that piece of the brain does Y and this other piece of the brain does Z and we know that because if this piece gets broken you know because you got a hit on the head or you had a stroke or whatever you tend to lose certain very discrete types of functions and you can learn, lose different functions. The reality is that if you look at these newer technologies that are able to image the brain in real time not just take a picture of what lit up and subtract mm -hmm. it out from everything else, but really follow uh, using full head uh, evoked potential or magnetoencephalography or something that can actually follow the response. In general, the, a lot of the brain is working to process information as complex as speech. And gosh, when you get into reading where you've got the, the language plus the written part of it to be decoded and reassembled and comprehended and whatever, 
you're really using, we are really using a lot of parts of our brain. And we certainly can fractionate out certain subcomponents of the process. But the truth is that reading is one of the more complicated uh, of the higher car cognitive functions using attention and rate of processing and sequencing and memory and the linguistic systems and the visual system and it having to coordinate this dance that's going on. And the more complicated the translation from the orthography to the phonology is in a particular language, the more complicated this, this processing dance has to be within the brain. And so I think the search for a single cause, for example, or a single basis for reading in the brain, a single spot in the brain that's going to be activated for reading, or a single cause why a child may have difficulty learning to read, is um, both fruitless and not likely to ultimately be correct, because it's too much of a dance, as I said. It requires too many moving parts. And that's one of the reasons, of course, it's one of the most fascinating areas of neuroscience. It's sort of like the, la the last frontier, as it were, I mean, other than consciousness. I mean, it's really high-level processing that involves many aspects. And if we can ultimately decode that, I mean, not decode it, but break it down, okay, we'll understand a great deal about how the brain works. And that's one of the reasons there's so much interest, in addition to just the human suffering that goes on for those uh, individuals who are struggling with, uh, with language and reading. So um, I don't. I hope that got to what you were trying to get at. I would like to get in at some point into the emotional part of it, but yes, you know, well, right. But yeah. we can do that at another point, you know, if you want. Like, why is why is there so much interest in literacy, and why is there so? I mean, I mean, language really does take us everywhere. If we think about what makes us human and what makes us be able to uh, function differently. Ultimately, it is. Uh, language, first oral language, and of course subsequently uh, written language. But uh, from the time we're born, our interaction with our parents, our interaction with peers, our interactions uh, with our sense of self, uh, very wrapped up with uh, um, the language system. And so, to, again, to try to separate out language, let's say, from the sense of uh, um, the development of self-esteem, the self-worth, and then, of course, you add into that um, a child who might be struggling at school, um, although I've heard many parents say, you know, it's such a frustrating problem, dyslexia or language learning problems or whatever, because everyone looks at your child and thinks they're fine, you know. If they just worked a little harder, they would be just fine, and yet you can see a child literally who started off being fine begin to wither on the vine as they begin to struggle at school and lose so much of their self-esteem in the process. So this is a major problem. Not only is it a major problem for long-term economic um, um, development of the country, of course, which is why they'll, I think, a huge focus on literacy, whatever, is, and everything. Of course, all children have to read. But I think that it's also a huge problem as um, just for humans to recognize the tremendous toll um, failure in school, and usually that manifests itself earliest as failure in learning to read, has um, on the development and the maintenance of self-esteem. And the sense of uh, the individuals who've had difficulty learning to talk or learning to read or learning to communicate. I mean, um, to the time they're adults, very successful, doing very, very well many times, they still, if, if you start to ask them about any of their earlier experiences, you can see that the pain of that failure or sense of failure has never left the, the person. Um, so this is a problem that is so multifaceted and so important and so hopeful because there's so much now that we have learned. And through that, we have been able to develop remarkable um, improvements in intervention and uh, the ability. I believe this is one of the reasons for studying this particular problem. This is a problem that we will be able to solve, that we are solving. And that's very, very hopeful. And so I see this as not only important to understanding how the brain works at the very highest levels, but also as something that we can, uh, as scientists, provide back into really getting a handle on improving um, the outlook for individuals who uh, have these problems. And from our baby research, my ultimate goal, I think are all of our ultimate goal, if we could really understand this early, 
then knowing what we now know about brain plasticity, about the use of uh, computer technologies for training programs or whatever, there's every reason to believe that we can nip this in the bud before the child ever has to experience the loss of self-esteem through difficulty in, uh, in school. And that would be, wow, <laughs> you know, what else would you want? That would be very exciting. Well, that's certainly part of what's motivating us. Mm-hmm. I mean, we understand that, that at the same time, perhaps more important than the child's uh, learning to read for its academic sense, mm-hmm. for the academic value in that and for its future economic potential mm-hmm. and so forth and so on, is that this learning to read environment is a learning environment in which they're learning about who, about themselves, mm-hmm. about how their mind functions and how they feel about how their mind functions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And before the imagery of self-esteem forms as a, a self-concept feeding back to them, mm-hmm. there's the affect of shame starting to mix into the cognitive process. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to speak to that when you talk about emotions. There's the kind of micro quantum side of the emotional spectrum in the in the uh, affective mechanics that are uh, concurring with the cognitive processes, mm-hmm. and then there's this downstream self talk story piece. Mm-hmm. Have, is your work um, gotten into the uh, affect psychology side? We need to have change tables. Do we? Okay, I was yeah. going to ask that. Well, I'm positive. a clinic. I don't know if you know I'm a clinical psychologist as yeah, well. Yeah, I heard you mention that, so training, been, this you know, is a question so, yeah. that's been in the springs for me. Yeah, so I use, I have uh, in the past done clinical therapy with families with children with language learning problems as well as other problems, but uh, just that whole issue of, uh, um, you know, see, beginning to see the child as the problem, you know, the reading problem rather than see the child as the person and how our society perpetrates that over time, and uh, what you can do about that piece of it. But, uh, and it's just beginning to come together with uh, an understanding of the interplay between the emotions and the cognitive side of, uh, um, and probably will probably tie together in the end through reinforcement systems, but, and through learning systems in the brain. Are you familiar with Sylvan Tompkins' work? No. Affect Imagery Consciousness, the... the relationship between affect uh, that broke down a series of uh, kind of like the precursors of, of emotion mm. and their relationship to cognition, mm-hmm. how both are involved in everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, parenthetically, I'll send you some stuff on that that you might like. But I, I'm really interested in uh, getting at how children develop their kind of emotional self assumptions mm-hmm. in the field of learning to read. I mean, learning I to read. On, is... I don't know if I'm the best person to kind of focus on that because I haven't done that much research there. Um, I know that my colleague uh, Mike Mersnick doing the work with um, they're doing some work with rats now on uh, neuroplasticity and learning. I mean, he's the one who developed the whole. The reason the company's called Scientific Learning Corporation is that Mike. Um, Mike's work developed a whole series of scientific learning principles <clears throat> based on heavy and learning and the work that he's done primarily with animals um, and um, about what what does it take to you know remap the brain so he's Mr. Neuroplasticity you know and uh, um, what it takes to remap the brain um, is a series of principles that have to do with uh, first of all having something to pay attention to um, and then having something you can do at a high level of accuracy so you can get a proper amount of reinforcement and reward. Um, Having the intensity for repetitive stimuli to come in so that neurons that fire together can wire together on a very repetitive basis. Um, And um, having appropriate um, feedback and reward. Um, And having, and learning has to be individualized. It has to be according to what it is, figuring out where your brain is at and what's the next step. It is a sort of a stepwise process. And um, <clears throat> some of the work that has been done with the nucleus basalis stimulation, that if you can do these scientific learning principles at the same time as stimulating the reward, some of the reward systems in the brain, then of course you're going to have even much more rapid learning. So uh, I think that uh, learning, of course, is one of the most elegant areas to study in neuroscience because it does have, it's one of the few areas that has the potential to go really from the cellular neurological level all the way up to the human condition, as it were. And uh, we haven't completely been able to do that in terms of bridging the gaps. And there's some in, some bridges that may be too big to jump in our lifetime, but I think that the area of learning and particularly 
through the focus on neuroplasticity, which is how do you change the learning in the brain um, over time? Then, uh, and what are the differences between the critical periods in which certain types of learning just seem to occur um, mo more um, overtly and what has to be done later if you're going to try to, uh, um, you know, kind of intervene in, in a process which doesn't seem to be as adaptive. So there may be different uh, approaches that have to be taken to uh, uh, to get into the neurobiological part of the system in terms of remapping and rewiring and whatever. And of course, you need technology probably for that as much as anything. <clears throat> Let me uh, ask you some questions, and, and this, the point of these will be to get some short things yeah, that we're going to okay. uh, spread around through the series. Um, what is reading? Let's just take that and give me a couple of sentences. Your crispus definition, what is reading? What is reading? Um, reading is a code um, that, when broken, allows you to uh, um, convey information in the form of a visual print in terms of uh, what it would have sounded like if someone had spoken it to you. The medial geniculate nucleus, which is involved in the auditory way station in this cortical loop down into the um, <clears throat> subcortical area. So it's a cortical-subcortical feedback system, and they're kind of distinct um, areas or nuclei for the different sensory systems. Well, what's interesting is within these different nuclei, there are two, two uh, basic types of cells. There's uh, one set of cells which are called the magno cells, and they're called magno because they're large cells. And then there's the parvocellular system, and those are smaller, more compact um, cells. The magnocellular system are larger because they're more myelinated. And so one of the theories is that uh, the magnocellular system is involved in the transient transmission of information, the rapid transmission of information, as well as a variety of other features. And um, so work of Al Galiberta at Harvard, um, who's done the only um, neuropathological studies of the brains at the anatomical level, the cellular level, the brains of uh, humans that had been known to be dyslexic before they died and then donated their brains for science and they were able to really study them. Al Galiberta's work had shown that uh, there was uh, there's a disproportionate uh, abnormality in the magnocellular systems in the both the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and the MGN and the medial geniculate nucleus, and that therefore translates back into a physiological, a neuroanatomical, neurophysiological basis for a difference in the processing rates that those brains might have been able to uh, uh, sustain. And so uh, Al Galiberta is a really good person potentially to talk with because he's developed a whole series of animal models <clears throat> to uh, um, look at what are the effects of having uh, deficits in the magnocellular system and also what are the connections between the magnocellular regions of the thalamus up into the cortex. And, uh, um, and, they, and then John Stein at Oxford has also really developed this magnocellular deficit hypothesis, which is one of the... Uh, um, pro one of the focuses right now on dyslexia research at the more physiological level. And it fits very, very well with the uh, um, temporal spectral processing deficit. In fact, many of the current theories, be they phonological processing deficit or whatever, they have in common um, that there seems to be some underlying difference in the... Uh, processing rates of uh, the individuals or difficulty in processing rapid transient information. And uh, John Stein's lab, um, Joel Talcott and Carolyn Witten, uh, and various other people in John Stein's lab at Oxford, um, have published some wonderful papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences recently, I think in 2000, that showed that, that really fit well with the study I talked with you about with infants basically showed that in, even in, if you look at just normal, healthy kids, if you look at a whole classroom of children, let's say in England, who, you know, different levels of reading ability, you know, you've got the whole spectrum of individual differences, that you find that the ability to process transient visual and or auditory information is, the, is very highly correlated. The visual transient processing seems to be highly correlated with orthographic abilities, 
and the auditory transient processing problems seem to be, uh, not problems, abilities, seem to be uh, highly correlated with um, uh, the phonological decoding abilities of children. And this is across the spectrum, so it's implicate, very nice. And implicate in both is the core processing frequency and yes. the ability to make distinctions. Exactly. That's what it's all about. It's, it, it implicates the core processing frequency and the ability to make distinctions, um, both in the auditory and the visual modality. And then how those come together. So they're highly correlated with each other. And what was really interesting in the Talcott et al. paper was that they showed that um, just the ability to process transients in non-linguistic stimuli. So they're now in this, they were talking about modulating tones and the rate of modulation, frequency modulation within tones and what, you know, how, what the threshold is for hearing a wavy tone versus a straight tone, as it were. Because when it goes woo, when, it's, when it, when it uh, has woo too fast, all of a sudden you start hearing a, a solid one. And just for normally developing children, um, your threshold, the individual child's threshold on that, uh, was as highly correlated with their um, phonological awareness, phonological decoding abilities, as their reading and spelling were correlated with each other. I mean, it's really very high levels of correlation. You may see at some point um, little new kinds of exercise toys for children that just draw out exercising the frequency of distinction in a more implicated general way to the various senses that are engaged right. in their play. Right. Well, I mean, that is, of course, uh, one of the underlying uh, ideas of the fast-forward training programs was, therefore, to say, well, if these, if these processing rates seem to be so fundamental um, and so uh, highly correlated, both predictive uh, correlations from infancy to childhood and also concurrent correlations throughout life with your uh, phonological abilities, your language abilities, your reading abilities, then uh, is it possible to drive these rates of of processing to make finer and finer distinctions right. in the brain. And so we can use computers to uh, basically do those experiments. And we have done so and found that, in fact, uh, we're, it's, it's amazing that uh, one is able to drive processing rates quite substantially uh, across the spectrum. You can make just about anyone a faster processor, but it can be um, very important for the individual who might be struggling with language and um, literacy skills because their processing rate may have been slower at a certain point early in their life where it was important. And you can drive them to faster rates of processing and then look to see whether or not language subsequently and reading skills subsequently improve, and voila, they do. <laughs> it would seem to me that there would be two yeah. fields that this would be applicable. One would be to having a faster frequency so as to be able to make the distinctions in time, mm -hmm. so whatever the variation is right. in what's going on in the world. Right. The second one is to have a higher frequency with which to go through the disambiguation that's involved in assembly, because on the one hand, we've got these distinct elements mm -hmm. which are required. Mm -hmm. but on the other hand, before we get to wherever we're going, we've got to assemble them. That's right, back together. We have to go so back together in some way yeah. in which the if there's ambiguity in the distinctions, it right. has to be processed exactly. through in the assembly. Mm -hmm. So the more that there's ambiguity in between that, the more there's time consumed in working it out, the more. Right. So our approach is to increase the speed of the processing mm -hmm. and wherever possible decrease the unnecessary ambiguity that's overwhelming the process. Right. And that is exactly the same to a, that is exactly the you know, coming at the problem from both ends that we've used in the development of fast forward. Exactly, you got it. You know, that's exactly what we tried to do. Both increase the processing um, capacity um, and also decrease the ambiguity in the signal itself by acoustically altering it so that these rapidly occurring frequency um, changes over time are slowed down and amplified. And then as the individual progresses in the various levels of language and language to reading and reading, one can begin to drop out these additional cues while at the same time having rewired literally the um, processing um, constraints that the kid had to begin with. How do we know that we really have literally quote unquote rewired it? Because we now have the advantage of uh, technological imaging in non-invasive imaging in humans, both through evoked potential, um, electrophysiological methods, and also through functional neuroimaging methods, both of which have now been done, ma magnetic imaging methods, and have been able to show that indeed, not only are the children behaviorally processing more quickly, their um, language and reading scores on standardized tests are improving, 
but the differences between their brains and the brains of children who are better readers are becoming um, less distinct over time. So those areas that are more involved in certain aspects of the reading task, particularly the phonological aspects, which are distinctly different between a group of children who are struggling with reading and a group of children who are reading, you know, really well, over time, if your methodologies of intervention are working, one should be able to determine that using not only behavioral methodologies, but also uh, physiological and neuroimaging. And so that's a real advance. I mean, this is brand new data. For the first time, we're beginning to see studies in which one is able to um, see the, to actually um, evaluate the effectiveness of uh, reading interventions or other types of interventions. Um, this is being very similar kinds of approaches are being used with patients with stroke, um, both in the motor system and the language system and the perceptual systems, uh, sensory systems. And particularly, it's going to be, we'll see, we'll see more and more studies coming out in which uh, these neuroimaging procedures are being used as assessments for the efficacy. Uh, first of all, assessments for a deficit, and then and then uh, used as an evalu- way of evaluating, an additional way of evaluating efficacy of one method over another. So it's a yeah, new what world. They seem to be having more and more in common is yes. this 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 thing you're speaking to about the processing speed at the center, right? And that that as you improve that through the exercise in any one domain or venue. Mm-hmm. It seems to be a general transfer because right. processing speed is implicated in everything. Well, I believe that processing speed is implicated in everything. I wouldn't say that all, all yeah. of my fellow uh, scientific that, yeah. colleagues agree with that, but uh-huh. uh, um, it, the uh, processing speed, um, I often say, which would you rather have, a slow kid or a quick kid? You know, And very few people will, will choose the slow kid. Um, so... That's sort of uh, a colloquial, right? It's a, right. <laughs> it's the colloquialism, but of way of putting it. But basically, um, to have a more rapid, more efficient um, brain is one that should translate into being able to process uh, the kind of information that is involved in language and reading systems more effectively. We say language and reading systems, and and and, and clearly they're part of the same continuum, but language depending upon which uh, scholar you track with, Mm -hmm. is somewhere in the 200,000 years human beings have been Mm -hmm. using language as we understand. We had a conversation about that. You could pin it genetically, or you could pin it in fossil records in terms of the structure of the face and ability to articulate and so forth. But it's very clear that reading, as we do it with an alphabet, is 3,500 years old, and only for a fraction of the time of the human evolution had there been reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a technological contrivance, artifact, mm-hmm. that sits on top of mm-hmm. our reading. Right. Um, and only a small percentage of the population, until very recently, was ever concerned with reading or right. writing. Right. So <clears throat> there is no evolutionary adaptive process. This no. Is definitely That's a very important point. Um, Although I talk a lot about the language to reading continuum, it doesn't mean that if you just, you know, that I assume that through evolution that reading will eventually become something built in like language is. I mean, language, you don't have to explicitly teach. Okay? That does not mean that language is not learned. There's a lot of confusion, I believe, even in the scientific literature about that. Because we have uh, more innate processes that facilitate the learning of language does not mean that it doesn't still have to be learned in the brain because we know that a deaf child does not automatically learn uh, oral language. There are certain features of communication that occur within signs that will occur even without any kind of formal training. So there's there's a motivation to communicate that's going to occur. But uh, language does have to be learned in the brain. But there's no question that reading is a um, much newer and um, you know, contrived system that was developed explicitly to uh, be able to transmit um, you know, in a more simplistic way the code of language, I think. And that has to be explicitly taught. Now, it doesn't mean that some children don't intuit it. Intuit it you know, if you leave children uh, alone with... Uh, you know, lots of information about uh, that comes from the reading system. 
together with feedback. You know, if the child's looking at something and you say, that's blah, you know, um, the, without explicitly teaching it, many, many children will break the code by themselves. So it doesn't mean that we don't have the capacity to do so. But um, reading is much more of a, um, of a learned and explicitly taught system. And most children need to be explicitly taught how to break that code. With respect to the small percentage that can take to it without, the 20% at best, right, that can take to reading without much intervention from the outside, mm -hmm. um, would you say that there's a strong correlation in that 20% that is taking to it without explicit external you know, uh, instruction and the uh, frequency of processing? I don't know. I don't know. Have there been any studies to no. try to correlate no. those two? No, there haven't I been. would think that would no. be really... That would be an interesting thing. But, you know, there's too much intervention already. Um, in 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 certain, I think that the uh, exposure to print is probably going to be a very important variable that won't be able to be controlled in those kind, in the kind of study you're talking about. Um, the sheer exposure to print, um, and that's why there's so much emphasis on reading your child's stories. I would have equal emphasis on uh, nursery rhymes, telling you know. Re repeating and playing around with nursery rhymes because they rhyme. And rhyming is a very, very important aspect of learning how to break the code because it teaches you to listen to the sounds that words make. And that is a big part of the code. So playing rhyming games with children. There's a reason why children like to hear the same book over and over and over again. And that is because that consistency is important for the brain when you're a little bitty kid. What you're looking for is the consistency not so much the message. A lot of parents go, I can't believe he wants that book again, you know, every night. Well, you might be thinking when you're reading the book that you're, you know, you're into the story that the book is telling. The child is at a point in their life probably where they're into the sound. And they're looking for that consistency in the sound, and that's why nursery rhymes are so wonderful. And the books that rhyme, the Dr. Seuss books and all that, that rhyme are very, very appealing to young children because it is reinforcing to the brain what reinforces a brain? The ability to process, I believe, reinforces the brain. If your brain is processing and getting reinforced for that processing, it brings a sense of well-being, brings a sense of um, being in control of your brain. I believe that um, one of the real issues for children with attention deficit um, in many cases is that their brain is actually having, is struggling to process um, the, the information that it's getting. And when your brain is struggling and can't get a sense of consistency, it's very disconcerting. And I always uh, suggest to parents, they think about sitting in a classroom where everybody's speaking Chinese and they don't know it. Or maybe they know a little of it, which is even worse in some respects. How long can you pay attention? How long can you continue? What do you feel like when everyone else is... Someone's out there talking, and you got a bit of it, but you miss the details, and all the other kids are kind of flipping to the correct page and getting started, and you don't know how to get started. What are the what what happens to you when you can't trust your own brain to uh, take care of this for you? I mean, what are the kind of defense mechanisms you might develop? You know, attention problems, impulsivity, acting out, being the class clown. Anything is better, in many ways for your self-esteem and for your sense of well-being than believing that you can't trust yourself to even process the information in your world. That's very scary. So I think that you develop these other mechanisms. This, that's, this is, this that's is a shame theory. avoidance. Shame avoidance. Yeah, it's a, of, it's uh, a shame avoidance to oneself, though. I mean, it's not only the external. I think we often think about the child who uh, is um, developing behaviors to cope in terms of how other people are going to treat them. That's certainly important. But I think ultimately it comes down to how you feel about yourself and can you trust yourself um, to get through the world, to keep you safe, to perform well, to make you feel good about yourself. And a lot of that has to do with automatic processing and automatic um, um, control of the information that's coming into your world. And I think that a lot of children who are struggling with that will develop a lot of compensatory behaviors to, uh, um, to try to uh, gather a sense of being in control. Even if it makes them get in trouble, 
at least they were in control of getting in trouble, whereas they cannot be in control of failure if they really can't do it. And that feels a lot worse. So that's just a theory. The it's not scientific, you this, know. You know, it's funny about, about affect science. Right. Really right down the pipe of that. Yeah. I think you'd really enjoy yeah. it. And it's yeah. an important connection to mm -hmm. bring yeah. those worlds together. Well, that's together. why I'm saying some of this, because you might be able to use it. It's not my scientific theory. Um, but it is my experience with uh, doing psychotherapy with families of children. I mean, one of the things that has been so interesting is if you have a family in family therapy, and they've come primarily because they have a child who has a learning disability, and um, you get started talking about the child uh, with the learning disability, what you often will find is that there has become so much focus on the learning disability for this child that the rest of the family... Even the brothers and sisters, when you ask, if you go around the room and you kind of ask everyone to say something um, positive or good about what an individual person is good at, you know, for the other kids in the room and the family, you know, he does this, he does that, he does that, well, whatever, we get to the child with the learning disability, they're always trying to figure out something academically that that child is good at. Well, that's kind of tough, you know. Well, yeah, he can kind of do math pretty well, you know. And yet, the rest of the family, they haven't focused just on the academics, but this kid has just become the academic part of himself. And so you say, well, isn't there anything else this child does well? Well, I don't know. He's not really good at spelling, and he's not really, oh, he's terrible at reading and everything. And we say, well, what about other things this child may do well? And so, well, kind of okay at geography. And you keep, and very, you finally say, teach to the test, though, yeah, I mean, but, like yeah exactly. And then you finally say, well, you know, does he have any friends? Oh, yeah, people just really like him. You know, he's so nice in the neighbors. Well, doesn't that count? Oh, I thought you just meant about academics. You know, well, they have gotten so focused because the school has gotten so focused and everything's become about this one area the kid is not good at at the exclusion of all the other abilities his child does have. And so, I mean, many times the therapy is just about re kind of rebalancing for the parents that, I mean, one of the things I often tell kids in private is, you know what? When you grow up, no one's ever going to test your reading again, <laughs> you know. So, um, and sometimes, you know, getting the parents involved in doing the testing has been really interesting because we do family genetic studies and we test all the members of the family and just to see them remember what it was like to be tested. A lot of times they've forgotten how uncomfortable they're, they're it is. They're developing this new thing for parent uh, report cards. A oh, parent report card. Oh, cool. <laughs> Parents are going to get report cards on how well they're participating in their child's education. Uh -huh, uh -huh, cool. Um, as we as we come to the end here, I, I do want to give you a chance to 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 as crisply as you feel comfortable with nail on a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of tests and what have you, <clears throat> the two thousand reading report card, national reading report card, effectively says that. 60% of our 12th graders are below the level of proficiency, 69% mm -hmm. of fourth mm -hmm. graders. I mean, this is not a minor part. This is a, the, the majority. We could say most of our children are less than proficient in reading right. after 12 years of our attempts to teach them. Right. On the one hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we've got NICAD saying that the first consequence is damaged self-esteem. Mm -hmm. The children become ashamed of themselves in their inside loneliness of mm -hmm. this whole reading experience. So it seems to translate to me that our education system and our approach to reading in general is teaching most of our children to be ashamed of their minds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you know, the statistics on the negative sequelae of failing to read are horrifying. And we, think, we continue to think about this as a small problem. It's not life-threatening, that's for sure, but it can be life-destroying for a lot of individuals, and we tend to forget that. Um, and so it's remarkable that there's no insurance coverage for most of the families who have children with these problems. Um, there's very few physicians who are more than just aware of the problem. There's very few individuals who specialize in this problem. I mean, many parents have said to me, if I had a child with any other problem, you know, I would have some high-level professional with a medical degree to take this child to, probably, to deal with the problem, and I would have insurance to cover it or whatever. But if my child has an educational problem, I'm on my own. You know, me and the teacher, who are very well-meaning, but many times don't really know what to do with the children who have a lot of difficulty in this area. And at the same time, we know that the long-term sequelae 
Uh, first of all, we know remarkably that if you know a child's reading ability by the third grade, you generally have a very high ability to predict um, whether they're going to graduate from high school or not and what their abilities are going to be and what their future is going to be. So by the third grade, I mean, that's the reason we hear all children will read by the third grade. We know that's highly predictive. Well, what are the rest of the statistics? I don't know if you want to hear the horror statistics, but it's quite remarkable. I had to... Uh, I had the opportunity to give a, uh, a report to the Biomedical Research Caucus, uh, Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus, so I went into looking at the statistics. And um, I, can, uh, I can get you the actual statistics. I can't remember the actual numbers, but it's something like uh, every, every public major concern has a much higher incidence of uh, um, reading problems attached to it, from juvenile delinquency to teen pregnancy, to failure to graduate from high school, to uh, um, drug problems. I mean, you take anything that it is that we say is a major concern, and there's a higher than expected incidence by far of individuals who have uh, um, had struggled with reading or had a frank learning disability. It costs twice as much in real dollars to educate a child in, in special education than in regular education. And yet, through the history of maintaining statistics and all the additional money that has gone in, we have seen a flat line in terms of the actual effectiveness of our current ability to remediate these issues. And yet we know that all these other problems are on the, on the rise as we have more and more children who are having difficulty in learning to read. So we do have a national crisis, um, well, probably an international crisis, but we do have a major crisis in this area. And as I say, on the, on the one hand, that's extremely disturbing and extremely um, pessimistic in terms of the statistics, but it's also one of the most optimistic areas that we have because we have new technologies, new research, um, tremendous progress is being made, and a real sense that this, interestingly, is one of those problems that we probably will be able to, if not fix, at least um, take a big bite out of, ultimately, through the, uh, our advances in understanding what the underlying etiologies are, what, how these problems come to be from the neurobiological point of view, from the sociological point of view, from the psychological effects that they have on children. And there are problems that, um, with the new, um, you know, as I said, with the new approaches, the new interventions, that we're seeing tremendous improvements. So it is one of the more hopeful areas of uh, research these days, and for society as well, I think. Uh, can we teach all children to read by third grade? Um, that's going to be a matter of uh, in enhanced translation of what we've learned from research out in the output of that into... Uh, um, the institutions that we have that train children, the public schools. Um, one of the most discouraging areas is how long it takes to translate that research into the classroom. But, as I said, the hopeful area is that it is really beginning to happen and uh, with uh, tremendous improvements being seen. Okay. Um, I can get you those actual statistics I, I, yeah, if you want. I've got slides of them. Well, you I've, seen, I've seen a lot of it, too, myself. The, the, yeah. Um, Uncanny correlations. I've got a, I'll send you, if you want, I'll send you the PDF that I use for I'd my PowerPoint it. presentation. That would be really helpful. Um, I've got a lot of graphics. You may certainly, you know, contact me about using any of it. Good. Um, the, you know, when I give a PowerPoint presentation, I've got all this stuff already graphed out, you know, the bas and dahs and the brain and the area of the brain that's involved. Any of those that you find useful or that you want to adapt, um, if you just let me know about it, if you want to use them outright, then we just have to deal with the copyright, copyright for the sure. journal. But if you just want to take Thank them you. and adapt That's them. Really wonderful. You know. And I've got some things to share with okay. you. Okay. Good. Also, scientific learning on the Brain Connection website. Um, there's, there's uh, what is it called? Um, cut art, not cut art, you know, little pieces. Clip arts. Clip arts yeah. uh, about the brain. And those, um, as long as you just say brain connection, they'd be thrilled. To, I mean, that's what Good. it's there for. All Good. this stuff about the ear, you know, the whole thing's all done. We're going to be building a website that goes into all this, too. We'll cross-link mm -hmm. with you. Okay, that. definitely. Is totally. a final kind of wrap-up here. Uh, give you one more chance for a sentence or two on reading that you feel good about. Uh, and then finally, imagine that you have a sentence or two that you could talk to teachers. If there was teachers and parents, people that are actually working with children, mm -hmm. 
who are witnessing the struggle that children are going through, is there anything that you think that, or that's in you to say to them mm -hmm. that's kind of short, that might be helpful in reframing mm -hmm. or otherwise mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. directing their efforts? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that for teachers, can you can you put it to me in a question, and then I can try to answer it as a question. If there's one thing. If there's, is there any one thing you'd like to tell teachers? Oh, if there's one thing I'd like to tell teachers uh, is to uh, I think that there's a tremendous amount of information that they are seeking, um, that they really want uh, on how the brain learns, and particularly how the brain learns language and reading that can be obtained on the web these days. Um, and there's some wonderful websites that focus just on that and that are done just for teachers, um, like Brain Connection. Um, I don't know if we can say that, but, uh, you know, Brain Connection is one of them. I think teachers very much want to be, to, uh, increase their understanding about how the neuroscience of education and how the brain learns. And so a lot of that information is available through conferences and through the website. Um, I think the other thing I would say to teachers is to uh, trust your instincts on the whole. They're excellent. And to uh, seek out those new technologies that can um, be real aids to you in uh, helping the children who are really struggling to crack the code. If there was something that you could have done to help many of these children, I know that it would have been done. I mean, there's been, it's not for lack of trying. That leads me to believe that there's certain things that need the aid of technology to, uh, um, to really facilitate in, in partnership with good teaching to help many of these children who are struggling. Excellent. Thank you okay. so much. You're welcome. Wonderful. Okay. All right.